Certainly. So today I am a trustee of the Internet Society. I uh, started working on uh, Internet and Internet technologies back in the early 80s at MIT, uh, doing work on actually applications, on uh, simulation. Um, through the years, I've been uh, chair of the SIP Forum, which deals with communications over the Internet. Uh, I've been chair of the IEEE USA Committee on Communications Policy, which uh, basically advises uh, the American government and uh, Congress and agencies on uh, basically the technical side of any policy issues that uh, come up. And I was also a director of the International Packet Communications Consortium, which again was dealing with uh, voice and video communications over the internet. Uh, in the commercial world, I was uh, head of the communications products division of BEA Systems and the chief technology officer of Newstar. And today, I run the Security and Software Engineering Research Center at Georgetown University, where we're working on secure communications and helping enterprises and people communicate securely on the internet. In the IETF, I've been a trustee of the IETF Trust. I've uh, written a number of uh, requests for comments, sort of the standards that come out of the uh, IETF. I've been a work group chair, and probably the work group that people can relate to the most uh, was a work group that did mobile messaging. Uh, so how to make uh, bring the internet to your, your mobile phone. On the technical side, I had started a company in the year 2000 dealing with uh, how to create applications on the internet and particularly targeted towards communications carriers. And at the time, uh, people were literally calling me stupid in public forums saying nobody would ever want to create applications using internet technologies. They'd want to keep using the traditional telephone company way of doing things. And when you get to today, it's the only way people make these uh, communications uh, applications. So that was a breakthrough in technology and being able to make it possible, but also basically convincing the world that you know, the open internet way would actually be better for them, not just better because, well, it's just open. Uh, on the policy side, uh, convincing people in, again, the US government in particular to not try to impose half understood, half baked technical solutions to address policy problems. Uh, that you know, some things that would seem obvious like blocking a website that uh, might be uh, feeding illegal content, which sounds like a good idea, actually has a lot of repercussions much, much farther than um, the, that one little issue. And to be able to convince a diverse group of uh, people in Congress to realize that, yes, that was a, a bad idea, and actually seeing a number of those initiatives uh, basically shelved, uh, that was you know, very, you know, I, I would call that a breakthrough. To put the weather in context, I would say it's isolated thunderstorms. It's not sunny, it's not totally stormy, but every now and then you get these thunderstorms rolling through. And the real question is, are we headed towards clear skies, or are we looking at a cold front coming through where it becomes totally cloudy and rainy and cold and miserable? I mean, the storms, you know, we've had long-standing issues in some countries with internet freedom. Uh, countries like the Russian Federation, China, Iran, Syria. But now we have new storms coming, uh, revelations about activities going on in the United States, the United Kingdom, and other countries. And this could blow over, or it could become a, a real almost nightmare of uh, governance on the internet and personal freedoms. There's been a collision of uh, legacy intellectual property merchants and the internet economy. Uh, and we've seen this with things uh, like SOPA and PIPA, the 
uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, and other treaties, ACTA, that uh, keep coming up. And again, some of the battles have been won. Some of the battles are still ongoing. And you know, we really kind of need to be active in, in how to address these issues. Uh, cybersecurity. Uh, which is one of my day jobs. You know, there's now a mix of espionage, um, corporate spying, IP theft, but then that gets confused by issues like we need to protect the children, or we need to protect our populace from uh, bad thoughts, or we need to be able to detect the traitors among us. And this is all getting wrapped up in uh, the, the rubric, the title of cybersecurity. And it makes it hard to address some very real issues of uh, how to keep people's data as their own, uh, but with other issues of, again, internet freedom. Uh, and it's a very difficult uh, kind of weather system to navigate. Because that was talking about the storms but you know there are some sunny skies out there as well. Uh, you know, we've seen where there are competitive markets. For internet access, we've got faster access. We've got uh, more availability, more reliability, less expensive. And what this means is there are now more people on the internet than there have ever been. And that number is actually still accelerating. And in particular, particularly gratifying, is it's accelerating in more developing countries. It's not, the internet is not just a thing for the rich companies. It really is changing people's lives all over the world. And as there's more local access, we're seeing more local content. We're seeing local equipment. People are building their own solutions. They're not depending on manufacturers in the United States or manufacturers in Europe. And they're coming up with local solutions, things that make sense for um, their environment and uh, their economies, which in a sense proves the value of the open internet model, that it really does foster innovation. It's not a technology imposed from above. It really is a technology developed from the ground up, where you don't need permission to come up with a new application or a new idea. And we hear a lot about um, sort of simple technologies that enable uh, you know, new economic models in the developing world. And that would not come about if a whole bunch of people in suits were sitting in Geneva or New York or uh, even Beijing trying to think of what will we allow people to do. With the internet model of just having an open internet and you can just experiment, people quickly come up with you know, very useful technologies, applications that you know, really can change the world. You know, this is part of why I'm motivated to, to, to work in the internet society and the IETF and the other you know, policy forums is we need to help policy makers understand the principles of the internet ar architecture, the principles of an open internet. We don't expect them to be experts in the technology, but being grounded in the principles can help them make better policy decisions because there are real issues of policy that need to be addressed around the world. But it's not just the policymakers. The technologists need to understand that there are real policy issues out there and to educate them about these policy issues so that we can come up, if appropriate, with technological means to help address some of these policy problems.